Dylan Smith is on your right with a Team Receptor Worm deck. Ian Plants on your left with Black Green Constrictor. We'll see how things go. Players will be given the green light. And we'll be underway here in round number 11 in just a moment. I'm very interested to see how this matchup shakes out. Uh, Dylan's deck is something I saw Zach Elsick stream with uh, a while back, and it looked like a lot of fun. But I don't know how competitive it is, but their, their team seems to be doing very well. It'll be a forest here for both players. However, one has a Land of War Elves, and the other does not in plants with a little bit of mana acceleration. Now he'll play a Woodland Cemetery. Yeah, Woodland Cemetery, a welcome addition to this Constrictor deck, giving it more untapped black sources on turn two. And now there's a Thrashing Brontodon. This is one of the better starts from Ian Plant's deck. Lennon Elf on turn one, a three drop on turn two. He's going to get the party started uh, pretty early here and hope to put enough pressure on Dylan to maybe force his hand a little bit with something like Hour of Devastation. And he's going to try to get his creatures big enough so that they don't die to that big sorcery sweeper. That would be the plan. Hour of Devastation, a card that on, uh, maybe surprisingly hasn't seen as much play when it was first previewed. I think a lot of people expected that card to be awesome. Turned out to not be the case, as there's an Abrade that's going to take care of Llanowar Elves. Obviously can't kill Thrash and Brontodon, but looking to cut the mana, as now here is a Rishkar Pima Renegade. Yeah, and if uh, Ian's able to follow this up with any sort of creature that can survive Hour of Devastation, there's a good chance that uh, Dylan just won't be able to come back from it. However, if he's able to play Ramp Spell this turn, and Ian can't get his creatures up high enough, then that Hour of Devastation is going to be a big deal. Ramp spells are something this deck has plenty of, as there is a desert. And let's see if this will be a ramp spell. It will. It'll be spring, the spring half of spring to mind. Three mana, search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, tap, then shelf your library. The mind part, four blue blue, it's an instant, and draw two cards. Yeah. This is going to be a pretty big attack here for seven on uh, Ian's side. Uh, he, he could potentially play a land and use Rishkar's ability for another mana and play something as big as Virgil's Gear Hulk. It looks like he's content to just shove in for seven and see what Dylan's going to do next turn. Well, it is worth noting that Blossoming Defense is a card here that could save the Brontodon. Yeah, Blossom Defense is, is usually a staple in this deck, but it looks like Ian is going for a little bit more of a uh, mid-range grindy route with things like Vraska's Contempt, uh, Vivian Reed, and it looks like he has no copies of Blossom Defense in his main deck. Instead, uh, leaning on stuff like Ravenous Chupacabra to generate two-for-ones instead. Well, right now Dylan Smith will be facing Lethal, so it's time to play Hour of Devastation and hope that this works, and it will work. So there it goes, Winding Constrictor, Thrashing Bronson on, and Rishkar Pima Renegade. The five mana sorcery that causes all creatures to lose indestructible and deals five damage to everything has resolved. It's swept the battlefield. And now Ian Plants has to rebuild. He's going to start things off with the Glint City Siphoner. Yeah, so th those of you at home may be thinking, well, why did he play the Winding Constrictor on that battlefield? And the answer is Dylan Smith's deck is not something that you see a lot in Standard. You know, and on top of that, he needs to have exactly our devastation to really punish Ian for playing that extra creature last turn. And if he just has something like a, a removal spell plus a creature on the following turn, uh, Ian needs to put more pressure on onto the battlefield in order to force Dylan's hand in some way. Here's an hour of promise. Yeah, and luckily Dylan has a, a desert on the battlefield already, so he's likely going to search up two more deserts of some form or another, and that's going to... Uh, generate enough deserts to create two zombies as blockers. Looks like going to be a hostile desert is one. And an Ipnu Rivulet will be the other. And now here are two zombies. And it's ideal that there are two there against the Menace Threat. As this team or Sifter Worm deck continues to do its thing, which is accelerate and then try to take advantage of after Aftermath spells and the card Sifter Worm itself. There's a Ravenous Chupacabra. That will take care of one of the zombies, which means that Glint Sleeve Siphoner can't attack safely in for two points of damage and generate a little bit of energy. That should be a second point of energy here for Ian Plant, so next turn he's threatening to draw a card. Get that token on the battlefield for y'all in just a second. We're going to go back over to Dylan Smith. No. 
I really like the look of Dylan Smith's deck right now. Even though it looks like he's behind, he has so many big, powerful spells, and he currently has access to at least eight mana. So if he's able to uh, clear the Siphoner here, there's a good chance that he's just going to win this game very easily. There's a cut to ribbons. Going to be taking care of that Siphoner. Just going to keep uh, Ian from drawing a card next turn. And uh, Dylan still had a healthy 7 with a commit to memory in hand, I might add. Dylan casts a checklist card. Yep. Looks like it's a thumbmatic compass. Flips into effectively a Maze of Ith, but one that taps for mana. It also generates a lot of uh, card advantage early in the game in control matchups by just continually searching out lands. Here, though, he's just going to want to protect his life total with the backside of Spires of Oraraska. There's the Spires. It does, of course, tap for mana, and then does play your Maze of Ith role here in standard. Not a card we see a ton of, but it is a pretty useful card in this particular deck. One that certainly looks to put as many lands as it can onto the battlefield. Here we have a Land of War Elves very late to the party. We're going to head back over to Dylan Smith, who's doing a nice job of starting to stabilize this battlefield. Then he can take advantage of his Aftermath cards and get way too far ahead. Yeah, and he already has uh, a Spring to Mine in the Graveyard, which means uh, he can play that at instant speed and hold up, um, commit to memory on his own turn. Here is a Spring. And there's a mountain. Still now with two copies of Mind in the graveyard. Yeah, and that's going to generate some uh, card advantage as this game progresses. Ian's not really putting up much of a fight. The Hour of Devastation really took the wind out of his sails. We're going to go back over to Ian now. Now, Cut the Ribbon is actually pretty difficult to play on the uh, the Aftermath part of that card in uh, the Siftworm deck. The only real way he has to, to play it is with Gift of Paradise, since Gift, of course, lets your land tap for two of any one color mana. And he, a, a lot of these decks end up on more copies of Gift of Paradise than anything else, but uh, Dylan's actually going for more copies of Grow from the Ashes, the three mana spell, since it does cycle if you're a little flooded later in the game. All right, here comes a mind. Taking one damage, of course, from one of his deserts in order to get blue mana there. Down to six, but again, when you're playing against Black Green Constrictor, you don't have to worry about direct damage. I mean, walking Ballista is a concern, but with him only having access to uh, six mana next turn, maximum seven, he's still in fine shape, especially with a blocker. Definitely just looking for a Sifter Worm here. He wants to hit uh, one of his big Aftermath cards in order to gain enough life to really make walking Ballista uh, an irrelevant factor. Haship Oasis has now joined the fray, and now here is the Mirari Conjecture. Yikes! Okay. We don't see this one a ton in standard. Pretty cool card, four and a blue. First chapter of this saga, return target instant card from your graveyard to your hand. So now back comes a braid. Second chapter will allow him to return a sorcery, and then the third one, well, that's where the real fun begins, and we'll get to that if we do. Yeah, the the, the, th the third chapter on Mirage Conjecture lets this deck go kind of bananas, especially with the Aftermath cards, because you can play the front side and then the back side and get a additional copy of each. Um, and additionally, when you uh, do the first and second chapter, you choose uh, an instant on the first and a sorcerer on the second. But many of these aftermath cards are instant on one and sorcerer on the other. And you basically get to pick and choose which one you want each time with the Mario Conjecture because you can choose whichever half of the card most benefits you. Unfortunately for Ian Plants, he just doesn't have very much going on right now. He's just kind of hanging out. <laughs> you saw him glancing at the camera. He's like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm getting destroyed. Yeah, he's like, I, don't, I don't have anything going on right now. My opponent's yeah. doing some desert things and got Mirari Conjecture. 
And I just I don't like how this is going. Draw a card, chapter two. I think our promise here seems like a, a fine card to bring back. You want as much mana on the next turn as possible. Uh, you go ahead and make two more blockers, and he still has enough mana to hold up Commit to Memory to protect himself from any of the craziness that might happen from Ian Plants. And it looks like he has his one of Banefire in hand. Oh, baby. So next turn, he's threatening to fork it for lethal. That sounds like a delight to me. Got to find a way to win. That's it. That's the one. Uh, you don't need much else. <laughs> well, there's our promise. I love our promise so much. Just being able to get Arch of Raska and creating two zombies just puts you so close to uh, uh, hitting the city's blessing. Just having a land to search out that draws cards every turn is huge in a deck uh, featuring our promise where all you want to do is just generate a ton of mana. More zombies and the city's blessing too. Looks like we have an update in our uh, humans versus counters company match. Looks like Gilbert Barajas able to win game number one here over Jackson Knott. Humans up a game over counters company. Sometimes a difficult matchup there for humans, depending on if counters company is able to put together a devoted druid or not, but it doesn't appear that was the case. So you see Ian's going to take a look at the Mirari's Conjecture. Uh, we'll do that again, too. I think Ian wants to know, what's the third chapter? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> That's the bad one. Okay. So the third chapter, I'm going to count your mana. This is probably bad for me. What he's actually worried about is ribbons, most likely, being yeah. forked. Maybe he doesn't even know that. Oh, right. Banefire could be a thing I lose to. Ian is just, just trying to figure out, can I, I can't do anything. Just going to pass the turn back. My deck's really good against other creature decks. I don't want to play against this. Yeah, I mean, uh, cards like Fatal Push and Vraska's Contempt are, are concessions to aggressive creature decks. Ryan with Chupacabra, the same thing. And uh, just not really well set up to beat cards like Mirage Conjecture. Fireball. I, I have to assume Dylan Smith thinks, you know, there's not a whole lot Ian can do here if I just point two giant fireballs at the Domeski. Can he do lethal and still hold up double commit to memory? <laughs> nice. Yep, that's 18. Yeah, I think that uh, will do it. Just make sure you don't make him an error here, which I think is smart. Take your time. Guess he could also just uh, do it for a little bit extra. Still has access to double a braid, which will kill both creatures and threaten lethal. Bane fire. 20 ball. This plays around Vraska's Contempt. I like this play. <laughs> That's uh, the look of a man who doesn't know what happened to himself. Oh, there is Vraska's Contempt. All right. You're 20. That's fine. I think this is, I think this is for 18. Okay. I think he's going to, yeah, okay. So then he'll break. Yeah, so it was going to be a Demon Fire for 18. Sure. 10 mana, so 9 times 2 is 18. A braid, 2 creatures, attack for 2, and that'll do it to it. So Dylan Smith is going to win game number 1 here over Ian Plants. Teamer Sifterworm up a game here over Black and Constrictor. We didn't even get to see Sifterworm, but I guess he just might not even need it for the matchup. <laughs> Who knows? No, I think you need it. You need to push yourself out of Ballista range on occasion. Made that one look pretty easy, though. Let's go to the sideboard here, and we'll start with Ian Plants, who's got four duress. Those will be pretty useful here. Oh, two Fatal Push, two Carnage Tyrant, two Life Crafters Bestiary, a Cast Down, a Shaper, of, a Shaper Sanctuary, excuse me, a Vivian Reed, a Vraska Relic Seeker, and a Vraska's Contempt. What do we like here? Uh, I like preparing for a longer game. You know, Dylan's got some removal with the braid and such. Uh, you know, uh, cut to ribbons, but you also need to make sure that you have some longevity against things like Hour of Devastation. I definitely like Duress. It interacts with almost every card in Dylan's deck, uh, and you can take away the more important stuff like uh, Hour of Promise. Uh, I, I don't think I like Carnage Tyrant, but it does survive Hour of Devastation and doesn't die to any of the removal spells, so I could be wrong there. Uh, Lifecrafters Bestiary is kind of in the same uh, textbook where 
you want to draw some cards, but you want to try to kill your opponent as fast as possible. Uh, Shaper Sanctuary punishes Dylan for targeting your creatures, but he doesn't know just how much uh, spot removal Dylan actually has access to. Um, and cards like Vraska's Intent, while they can clear Sifter Worm, I don't know if that's actually what you need to be doing. For Dylan's side. Pretty diverse sideboard here. Two Chandra's Defeat, two Magma Spray, two Negate, two Sorceress Spyglass, two Torrential Gearhawk. Five one of some fun ones here, too. And a Braid, well, that one's not that fun. Banefire was just a game winner, so that's pretty fun. Palaka Worm. Love it. All right. That's a, a rare and core set 2019. <laughs> waka waka. <laughs> Blink of an eye, not a sideboard card you see all that often. And then the big one from Amonkhet, Sandworm Convergence. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of of these ramp decks having a bunch of weirdo one-ofs that are good in some matchups. Games can go pretty long, and you see a lot of cards uh, with things like Spring to Mind drawing extra, Sifter Worm uh, filtering through with the Scry ability. Uh, I think you just want to make sure that you can contain the early threats, though. I think stuff like Magma Spray is going to be okay for taking care of Siphoner, uh, Llanowar Elves, things that uh, could get in the way early on. Uh, usually your deck is good enough to win the late game, so if you're able to win the early game too with stuff like Magma Spray, I think you're in good shape. Uh, don't really like Spyglass. Turn to Gearhulk might be okay if you think you just need to grind through creatures uh, consistently with your instants, uh, but I don't know exactly how good it is. Uh, I would do want the, uh, the the extra braid. The Banefire, maybe you want it just because you expect to get hit with a lot of discard spells and finding your second one to close the game with Mirage Conjecture could be worthwhile. Uh, cards like Palakorum, Sandworm Convergence, I'm all in on. I just want to gain a bunch of life, put up a big old threat. They can check something uh, like a Winding Constrictor plus Rishgar P Pima Renegade. And uh, Sandworm Convergence is just a great win condition in this kind of deck. Well, those are the options there for both players. Pretty one-sided game there from Dylan Smith. This Team Receptor Worm deck is a lot of fun. It's got some power baked into it, too, and you saw that in that particular game solely based off of the fact that it plays a copy of the Marari's Conjecture. Well, game number two is going to be underway here in just a moment. Let's talk about SCG Game Night very quickly, the very popular promotion, which you can bring to your store. And if you've already got it here, we are in the month of August. And for the rest of the month, Order of the First Cheese are the tokens and pins that you'll have the opportunity yeah. to win in September, which will get here sooner than you think. It'll be Garden Tendencies pins and tokens and then of course in October you can be heads of the class. Look at that goat eating the homework. I respect <laughs> that. You pins know, and tokens there as well. I've used that uh, excuse once or twice in my day. My goat ate my homework? Yeah, now I got proof. Yeah, I guess. Photographic <laughs> evidence. This is, this is exactly <laughs> the, where yeah, it My is. pet goat ate my homework. Go to starcitygames.com slash game night for information stores. Please do contact your starcitygames.com in stores play in store play representative if you'd like to get signed up. Have you ever had one of your pets actually destroy your homework, though? Didn't have pets. Okay. Up, no. I had a dog that literally destroyed my, uh, like, my science uh, project. It was like a cardboard diorama type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just jumped on it and destro it just destroyed it. Just, I had, you know, I spent like four hours gluing things on. What kind and, of dog you have? Uh, Poke some, it was, holes, it was a, poke some holes in this story. It was a, no, it was a, <laughs> <laughs> it was a big old mutt. Uh, it was like part. Uh, I want to say. I don't even remember. What was your dog's name? I don't remember that either. I was very young. Oh come on, dude! I had a lot of pets growing up. Oh really? Yeah, I had a ferret named Bandit. I remember that because his name is great. You had a ferret? Yeah. All right. I live out in the country. We had a bunch of pets. When I was real young, we had. A, I had a dog. His name was Buster. I'm gonna. When, he when, could climb fences. When the traveling ceases, I'm the first thing I'm going to do is get a dog. The first thing. It never ends. You're in this hamster wheel forever. But when it will cease eventually, I'm not gonna be doing this until I'm 60, man. Okay. I don't know. Or 50. Yeah, I mean, you could be like the John Madden of SCG tour. I'm good. I want a dog before that. You just get dementia on screen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine what the cards will look like 20 years from now. Just one red deal 15 to someone. Oh, you know. Not pushed. 15 to a creature, I guess. <laughs> there. <laughs> there. And if you control an island, you can deal it to a player. That seems fair. I mean, island is the best card in Magic. That's yeah. You got to reward people for playing islands. I might just have a staunch no island rule for the rest of my life. That seems aggressive. How else are you going to play Death Shadow? I just won't. 
Well, that's stupid. It's a great deck. Play death and okay, how about no basic island? Good. How about no basic island? Underground Sea's okay. Water Grave's okay. No, no island. No island, but I can still play blue cards in my deck. Like yeah. humans, no islands. I mean, it got Sea Chrome Coast. That's not an island. Yeah, that's fair. I'm just going to be on a, no, a, a hard no island rule. I can still play my Reflector Mages and my Mantis Riders. Still be totally and my Phantasmal Mages. Still be totally fine. And all these people that put an island in their human stack, just cut it and play another Sea Chrome Coast. Problem solved! Yeah, Problem until you solved. get path the second time or well they win then or field of ruin the first time and then path you know i do have to try humans with that the island is pretty good i mean it's specifically good because the matchups where bugler is is important getting that extra land is also very important i don't know any matchups where bugler is important okay that's the thing all right I'm going to love the next time you play a, a modern event. That'll be, and you play, that'll be Grand Prix Detroit. And you play humans, and you just choose not to play Bugler, and your team yells at you. My teammates for Grand Prix Detroit, of which I don't know how I got them, Ben White's and Logan Nettles. Nice. Yeah. He's Logan's a nut. I know, and he's way better than me, and yeah. he's excited to team with well, me. I don't know why. Because but. you're his favorite magic personality. You're the face of the SCG Tour. They said I can play humans however I want to. Wow, and that's I, aggressive. And I told them, thanks. Look here, boys. You said thank you. I said no buglers here. But I might, I might, I might. We'll see what happens. Still a couple weeks out. I'm playing four Reflector Mages, though. These people are crazy. Sure. I'm fine if you just play two buglers and four Reflector Mage and four Image. That is A-OK -okay with me. I just like having access to three. Maybe you board the third one. I just think that your obsession with Thalia, Heretic, Cathar is unhealthy. It's not an obsession. It's a great card. Yeah. Okay. It wins me a lot of games online. Okay. I've I've seen Bueller on camera like five times this weekend or so. Small sample. And it's been great every Small time. Small sample. I mean, when it happens every time, and it's great every time. That's just what I'm going to say every time. It's just yeah. small sample. Yeah. Stop being so results-oriented, yeah, Todd. That's, a, that's the classic phrase. Even though your original argument was, I played two rounds that with it. That was a joke. I missed once. I, that, that, I played that against happened. a bad matchup the other that time. That also happened. Bugler sucks. Small sample. <laughs> and obviously the first time I, act, uh, for the first time I cast Bugler, I whiffed. Yeah. The first time. And I went by a Mantis Rider, obviously. Yeah. If that's not... A great example of why that card stinks. Nothing is. There You're you right. Nothing is. There you go. There it is. Results-oriented thinking. <laughs> Let's start off with a Blooming Marsh into a Lana Worlds. This is a start very similar to what Ian had in the last game. Was not effective enough. We'll see if Dylan can do a little ramping. Going to start with an Ipnu Rivulet. Yeah, Dylan looks like he did take a mulligan in this game. Uh, let's see how his hand shapes out here. On the draw is definitely uh, a spot where you can get run over by this Constrictor deck, especially if they lead off with Atlanta Worlds on the first turn. Got to remember now, Constrictor also has Duress in their deck after sideboard. Four copies here for Ian. Duress, a great card in this matchup. There's another Atlanta War Elves. And another Atlanta War Elves. Yeah. Well, that's not all that exciting. No, but he can play... A Virgis Gearhog next turn, and if he has a land, he can also attack for five. That's not so bad. All right, back over to Dylan. If he does have Virgis Gearhog, though, I expect him to try to make multiple creatures bigger than five toughness to try to play around uh, Hour of Devastation. There's the Oasis. Looks like he's taking a damage, so it's got to be Search for Escanta, right? Yeah, Search for Escanta most likely. Could also be uh, the Compass. Yeah. But it'll be Search... So he falls down to 19. That'll be a way to help out the draw steps. Yeah, filtering here early, not remotely close to flipping, but flipping actually makes it a, a, a very relevant card in the Sifter Worm deck. You're basically just trying to ramp with a lot of your spells, and uh, that extra mana you get from flipping the Search for Escanta into the Sunken Ruin is a big deal, even just for the mana side. There it is. All right, there's Mr. The Boom hole. Boom. Real clock on the battlefield now. This means that Dylan has to have a ramp spell next turn. Yeah, if he doesn't have a ramp spell, he's in a lot of trouble. But he's thinking about now, do I shove in for five damage on a land or elf and risk getting my board swept in a few turns? Or do I just make an 8-8 eight, eight 
you know, or maybe make a six six and uh, put two counters on the Lenorf that can attack. It's got it's got a few options here. Well, he's thinking about that. We'll tell you about this. Updates are plenty, my friends. We got Death and Taxes and Grixis Delver. They're all tied up at the top. And then Humans versus Counters Company. They're all tied up in the middle. We could be tied up here at the bottom. As we've got Lana Rells into a 4 4 and Verdant Gearhulk into a 5 5. That's a weird split. It's a, it's a bit of a hedge for sure. I, I think there's a chance that Ian has Rishgar in hand. And uh, next turn, he wants the Gear Hulk to get up to a 6 6, but deal enough damage this turn to put a lot of pressure on Dylan. Um, that. Uh, plays a little bit around a braid as well because if you just put all the counters on Virgin's Gear Hulk, a single braid takes away all the wind out of your sails. Very true, very true. And a braid is a card that we did see in Dylan Smith's deck last game, so that is something that uh, that Ian does have to be cognizant of. Now, grow from the ashes in hand here. Notably, he doesn't have a second red source, so even if he's able to fetch up a mountain here. He's going to have to peel a mountain to cast our Devastation next turn. And that's assuming that Ian isn't able to get the Virgis Gear Hulk uh, plus one toughness. Here's Grow from the Ashes. A card with Kicka. Sometimes you can search for two. Just now, however, you search for one. And it is worth noting that the land that you do search for does enter the battlefield untapped with Grow. Maybe a little bit weird. You're used to seeing your ramp spells put the land on the battlefield tapped, but especially when you kick Grow from the Ashes, those lands entering the battlefield untapped will allow you to maybe play a second spell in a turn. That is an Ether Hub. The power of the kicker on Grove from the Ashes here is, is pretty good for this Hifterworm deck in general, being able to get two untapped lands. Uh, you, the deck has a lot of two mana spells it can cast. So it effectively only costs three, but then your next turn is going to be uh, significantly bigger. Well, here is Rishkar Pima Renegade. You had a feeling this could happen, and it looks like it's going to. So we'll see where the counters are placed. One on Verdant, excuse me, Virgilus Gearhulk, and the other one on a little Llanowar Elf. And now things get really, really difficult because now our devastation is not a board wipe. Yeah, and this is a, a huge attack. It's going to leave Dylan Smith with just a handful of life points. This is an attack for 13, I believe. Oh. Make that one life point. Yeah. I think we're on a no out of here, folks. Because our devastation, no good. Search will be a trigger. That'll put Ipunet, Ipunet, Ipnu Rivulet, pardon me, in the graveyard. Well, there's the untapped mountain. There's our devastation. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I got it. And Ian said, yeah, Mike Gearhawk lives, so that doesn't matter. And Dylan Smith will concede the game. So Ian Plants and Dylan Smith are getting ready for a third game. And we're all tied up across all three matches here, folks. All three matches. Now, I do think, Todd, that things get a little bit better here for Ian after sideboard. Even though we didn't see duress in that particular game, we saw a quick clock, and we saw creatures out of the range of our devastation. Yeah, and now that he knows what he's up against, this teamer, Sifter Worm deck, he can actually sequence a lot of his spells to protect himself from the big sweeper in Hour of Devastation. We saw that game. He was, he uh, he distributed his Virgis Gearhold counters in a way that put maximum pressure on Dylan while hedging his bets against both a Braid and Hour of Devastation and following it up with a Rishgar Pima Renegade once the, the coast was clear and making sure the Hour of Devastation wouldn't be uh, too devastating. All right, they're going to shuffle up, so that means we're going to talk about a couple different things here. Number one, let's talk about Meals on Steel, a playmat that you can get September 20th and the 30th at the Guilds of Ravnica Capri release. Those, of course, the ones that are affiliated with Star City Games. Exclusive playmat available at participating stores. We got our friends from the Creature Collection, Fox, Kraken, Hippo, Bunny, Kitty Cat. It's burb. Just, they're just <laughs> hanging out after a hard day's work. Just having a sandwich. You can find Eat a pre-release that has this awesome playmat at go.starcitygames.com slash pre-release. Get yours. Find a pre-release. Have fun at Gills Ravnica pre-release, too. It should be an awesome set. Have some with your local players as well. And best of all, I can tell you the perfect thing to put this playmat in. Oh, yeah?
pick up your map pot today and other Ultimate Guard products at go.starcitygames.com slash Ultimate Guard. Proud sponsor of the SCG Tour. You're really good at that. What's that? Just product com combining, selling stuff. It's part of the job, man. Pumping, pumping the, the brand. Yeah, part of the job. <laughs> Get it out there. Get some sweet stuff. Maybe one day I, too, can sell brands. Maybe. <laughs> I think you'd be. I think you'd be an integral part to the Alabama Crimson Tide brand. Oh, maybe one day they could use some help, right? Yeah, they yeah. really need it. They're really, yeah, they're <laughs> having a tough time down there, <laughs> yeah. getting, getting the best recruits and winning football games. Yeah. Yeah. That should be the goal. You should be the next. What was that doofus's name? Lane Kiffin. We don't talk about Lane. Uh, Kiffin. We, don't, we don't talk In about Alabama. big. We don't talk about big Lane. We uh. You can we, be the next Lane. We we tolerated him for a couple of years. He used to be the uh, the head coach for Tennessee, oh, one yeah. of our big rivals. Oh yeah. Uh, he eventually left Tennessee to take a head coaching job at USC. Kind of let that program down. I'll say that. And then we kind of pity hired him to be our offensive coordinator, and he did a pretty good job. But he got a little too fancy. He ran the offense in a way that a lot of people didn't like, including myself. Specifically, he didn't run the ball enough. Alabama's usually got a really good offensive line. Got to run the ball more. They generally have really good running backs, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe multiple Heisman uh, quarterbacks in the last seven years or eight years or whatever. Yeah. yeah or I guess nine years because Ingram and then. Oh, you mean running backs. Running backs. Running backs. Whatever. Same thing. Just kidding. I just misspoke. Not I know football. Why was Trent Richardson so bad, huh? Why were all your running backs there so good that Trent Richardson it's was a brown? He was terrible. All right, let me let me tell you a little thing about uh, the Alabama offensive line. They are on average around uh, thirty-five to forty pounds bigger than any defensive line would play against, which means they literally shove everyone out of the way. And I could run for an average of six yards a carry. Ooh, now that is something I like to see. Can we get you in one Alabama game? <laughs> Todd Anderson with the ball. Uh, I bet you could run for like three yards a carry. I, I used to be a running back when I was in uh, high school. Behind that line, I think you could crush it. Yeah. Another Atlanta War Elf here. Good start. All right, what's going to be the turn two play here for Ian? Ian really showing who the real ramp deck is with his Lanor Elves. All three games, mind <laughs> you. Yeah. It's a good card when you draw on turn one every time. Well, that's a pretty early duress. Maybe the goal here is to nab a ramp spell. Yeah, or just to see what the maybe sequence around and play around over the next few turns. Well, cut to ribbons. Spring to mind. Commit to memory. Split card mania. And a couple of lands. And yes. ne'er a sifter worm in sight. I, I'm, I'm convinced it's not in the deck. Haven't seen one yet. That's what the people came for. So if I were in Ian's shoes, I would recognize there's no red mana across from the table and Dylan's side. Taking cut to ribbon is not really that important. The ramp spells is really where Dylan's deck starts churning. But it also color fixes him. Yep. So taking that ramp spell, I think, is, is uh, the right play. Here's a Thorn Lieutenant. Yeah, Thorn Lieutenant, a huge upgrade to the, the Mono Green Steel Stompy decks that we saw a lot over the last few weeks, but making an appearance here in this uh, Black Green Constrictor deck and, you know, providing a, a, a reasonable body with a Mana Sink that uh, punishes spot removal. Yep, new reveal at the play. Unfortunately for Dylan, no ramp spell top deck. So we'll have to play relatively fair this game, which is, of course, in favor of Black Green Constrictors. Here's a Rich Car. Put a counter on the Lieutenant. Put a counter on Atlanta War Elves. I think we might see an attack here in just a moment. We will. Healthy one for five. Yep. And uh, now that he has the Rishkar active, uh, if he is able to untap next turn with the Rishkar, he has enough mana to actually cast a Verger's Gear Hulk and perhaps put multiple creatures out of Hour of Devastation range. Well, we are pretty far from Hour of Devastation range now. It's true. No red mana. No ramp spell, but a single growth from the ashes or hour of promise could change that in a, uh, very quickly. Commit to memory, obviously on the radar here. Salt via duress has the mana available. Does Dylan Smith? 
So Ian Plants has to worry about that card at this stage, and that's really about it. So he'll make it easy. Let's attack. Do you want to commit something and prevent some damage? Because this is seven and half your life total almost. All right. Looks like Dylan will take it. You know, you have to think that uh, Dylan has Blossomy Defense on his brain as well. It's a card that a lot of Black Green Constrictor decks play. And even though Ian's not playing it, it's possible that he didn't use the commit there during combat because he's afraid of getting hit with that Blossomy Defense. Well, there is commit on the Thrashing Bronson on at least. Put that spell second from the top. Let's go over to Dylan. Forest. Still no red mana. All you can do is pass the turn back. And this shows a little bit of the problem here with this Teamer Sifter Worm deck. It is cool, and there are games where it can be dominant like we saw in the first one. But when Duress shows up, along with a good clock, this deck does have some difficulty functioning. Yeah. That taking away that ramp spell really slowed down his development. Uh, I don't know if he has a 7-drop in hand, but he hasn't been able to cast that red spell with... Uh, uh, the cut to ribbons because the spring mine was taken out of his hand so early on. Here's an attack. There's an activation of Thorn Lieutenant, and if Ooh. this resolves, that That's is going to do it, and it will do it. Ian Plant's going to win this game and match over Dylan Smith. Give his team the lead as Black Green Constrictor able to take care of Teamer Sifter Worm. Dylan's deck able to do a really nice job game number one, but game two and game three fumbled and stumbled, and Black Green Constrictor was just too much. Yeah, Thorn Lieutenant really uh, showing its it's are stretching his legs, so to speak. Uh, not only did uh, get an extra counter early on with the Rishkar, but it was also able to use its pump effect uh, to great effect and close that game out a turn sooner than it normally should have been. That's a new one, of course, from Corset 2019. You saw it ori originally in those modern green aggro decks that have been popular over in Standard. Let's turn our attention to modern now. We're going to watch Gilbert Barajas on humans against Jackson not playing counters company. Let's take a look at the battlefield here for Gilbert. He's got a Thalia, Garden of Thraben. He's also got a Vial on three, a Vial on two, and a Grafdigger's Cage, along with a couple of lands out there, most of the five-color lands on the battlefield there for our Humans player. For Counters Company, a whole bunch of lands, Birds of Paradise, Devoted yep. Druid. Let's make it two of those, along with a Kitchen Finx. Most notable card on this battlefield, far and away, is Grafdigger's Cage. That card shuts off Collect a Company, Court of Calling, and the ability for Kitchen Finks to return from the graveyard via Persist. All right, good power. Reflector Mage is here. Yeah, it looks like a, a Ronus uh, was on the battlefield, and that's going to be returned to Jackson's hand via the Reflector Mage. Yeah, what it looks like to me right now as we jump into this game, Jackson's trying to win this thing not the way he loves to, just by attacking, using his creatures, having them be good. Because, as you mentioned, Collective Company, Court of Calling, some of the better aspects of Counter's Company, those are off right now. Yeah, when um, the Counter's Company deck was really popular, this is even before Devoted Druid was uh, in the deck. Um, I guess before Walking Ballista was printed. You know, the, 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 the Logan, Mize, and Ooh, that I've, contingent from I Florida. Heard that name in a while. Bradley Carpenter, those guys yep. played a ton of the Malir version. Yep. And uh, Grafdigger's Cage was, like, seeing a lot more play because of that deck specifically. I don't play Grafdigger's Cage anymore in my Humans deck, but luckily for Gilbert, he had it at the ready, and it's probably been doing some work for him in this game. Yeah, this is a card that I think Counters Company right now just doesn't expect to see from anybody. I think, you know, that's part of the appeal of maybe playing the deck right now for Jackson Knott, which is I don't think people are really playing this card right now, so I can kind of do this thing with my deck. However, he ran to somebody who is... And we're going to get a Vial activation here. This will be a Reclamation Sage. Not going to blow up anything. Of course, it is a May ability on Rex Sage. Some of the older ones, not May abilities. I know Tabi Orangutan has to kill something. It does. Pretty sure Viridian Shaman has to kill something. It does as well. Made some for some uh, awkward moments back in the day. Looks like that may be a Thalia's Lieutenant. It is. Let's see if we can actually get that amongst the creatures there. Looks like Brandon Smith won Legacy two games to one. So this is it. This is the deciding game of the match. Unfortunately for the team of Smith, Not and, and well, I guess Smith, Not and Smith. <laughs> Smith, Smith, and Not, a law firm. It's getting pretty tough here. 
Yeah, unless he finds an answer to Graph Digger's Cage, all of his game breaking spells are going to be turned off. Archangel wow. Avison off the top. Whoa, what a draw. Where did that come from? Jeez. Uh, wow. You don't see this card very often. No, and hilariously enough, if he, he can flip it if he wants to at basically any point over the next few turns, thanks to Devoted Druid being able to put a minus one, minus one counter on itself. So Archangel Avison just a huge card in this situation. This game was looking terrible for Jackson Knott. Now it looks extremely winnable. Yikes. Actually, this looks horrible for Gilbert. How's he supposed to beat this thing? I don't know. And with Ronis coming back next turn after it gets unlocked via Reflector Mage, uh, I don't know how Gilbert actually wins this game anymore. Mantis Rider, bad draw. Arcane Johnson has Vigilance. Yeah, what, are the what, what is the best draw that Gilbert can have here? Because even a card like Reflector Mage bouncing Archangel Avacyn, not ideal. No, the fact that it has Flash means uh, even though it's locked down next turn, it's only locked down on the main phase. Here comes Ronis, I think. No, oh, Kitchen Fink's going to kitchen gonna be good, too, padding the life total of Jackson. Let's see, confirming the life totals here. It looks like 6 to 19 is accurate. Well, we'll make sure all is good. And that should be the Ronis. And would you look at this. Would you look at this comeback? Yeah, single Archangel Avison. Uh, pretty sick. And it looks like Jackson is actually at four after that Finks. But as you mentioned, the fact that Jackson has this ability to transform Archangel Avison at any moment, very, very scary stuff. As here comes Kitchen Finks and Archangel Avison. Archangel Avison having Vigilance is obviously huge. Flying is huge. It's all huge. Yeah, I mean, even if Gilbert's able to draw a big threat next turn. Uh, as long as it's not Reflector Mage, uh, Jackson can choose to flip the Archangel Avacyn. Uh That's obviously going to clear off the entire side of the battlefield for Jackson and Gilbert, but it's going to leave him with an active Ronus that can attack an Archangel Avacyn that's big, as well as dealing three to Gilbert. All right, let's crack a Rising Canopy new card. Team over competitors, that is time for the round. Back to player, finish your turn and continue the match with five additional turns. We're going to take a look here at Ronis, the Indomitable. A card, again, you do see in standard quite a bit in mono green aggro. A deck that does splash black or blue on occasion. Not a card you see a ton of in modern, but right now looking pretty darn good in combination with Archangel Avacyn. It'll get to attack. It's activated ability. It's likely to be quite relevant. And again, for Gilbert Barajas, this game changed drastically once that angel showed up. I can't imagine he was playing around it. Why would you? Not a modern staple. Not even a staple of Connor's company. No, it. it a lot of people played one of uh, way back when the deck first uh, became popularized with the Devoted Druid version and Vizier of Remedies. Uh, it was a pretty sweet uh, target for Court of Calling. To protect yourself from things like Supreme Verdict, uh, Wrath of God, and such. But I, I would honestly never play around it, especially drawn as a random card in the middle of the game when you're very far ahead. Yeah, when you have a Graft Digger's Cage, too. They'd have to actually just have it in their hand, like you mentioned. No. That is so unlikely. Well, looks like here we can pump uh, effectively three times if we crack that fetch land. Yep. Uh, that's six damage, all trampling. I don't think that Gilbert has a way to stop this from being lethal. Yeah, the attacks here, both Kitchen Finks, Ronus, and Archangel Avacyn. Notably, Ronus cannot give himself Trample, but he can give the Kitchen Finks Trample, which are going to be the primary blockers or blocked cards here. You see, I call this the hand-waving dance. Both teams talking with their hands. Gilbert looking at his teammates saying, hey, dude, what do I do? How the heck am I supposed to get out of this? <gasps> oh, Phantasmal Image. If it's Phantasmal Image. Oh, ho, ho, ho. All right, let's take a look at Ronus really quick. It might not be enough, but it might be. Hold on. All right, Another so. target creature. So he can target Phantasmal Image. Oh, you're right. If he sees it. If he sees it. Oh, he picked it up to read it. He picked it up to read it. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, so that will make the Reclamation Sage and the Dolly's Lieutenant indestructible, but it's not going to be nearly enough. He just targets uh, the Phantasmal Image before blocks, and then uh, after the other two creatures block, he can pump uh, either one, but he only really needs to pump one, I think. All right, let's see. So it's uh, 7, 10, 12. So he, all, he needs to pump three times, so he has to, like, fetch shock, I think. And I assume he has another land in his deck where he can get with the, with the shock land. One would assume. One creature definitely has a block Ronus. Ronus definitely targets Phantasmal Image. So long as Jackson knows that that's an option. Right. Because you might not think that now, now to their credit, both teams <laughs> have read Ronus. Okay, so he sees it. Knows that, hey, I can target it. Now, your creatures are still indestructible. I'm going to sack this. Yeah, players want to communicate. You see the teammates stepping in here, too. Part of team constructed saying, I think maybe you should block here. I think maybe you should block there. It's still lethal regardless of how he blocks. Uh, I think teammates trying to make sure that he blocks Ronus instead of one of the kitchen fixes because it's uh, a little more damage and can't get trampled to itself. Yeah, better to better to block Ronus. So he's still fetch shocking, going to one, pumping two things, uh, definitely pumping the kitchen finks that's being blocked, and that should be more than enough to to deal the last few points here. So Jackson's going to sacrifice the Heath. Important that there's a land left to get. There's a forest. Otherwise, that would have been awkward. There's your pump. There's your other pump. Yeah, and with no cards in hand, Jackson doesn't really have to play around anything. And this is going to be all she wrote. And they look at the life totals. Four trample from the Finks. Uh, five from the other unblocked Finks and four from the Avacyn should be enough. That should be. Yeah, I think uh, I think the team of Brandon Smith, Jackson Knott, and Dylan Smith, they're going to get it. That Archangel Avacyn.